Hi, this is Alan Baxter, and welcome back to the Baxter and Mark Chronicles, our next chapter, and thanks for joining me. You know, up to this point in the Chronicles, I've talked mostly about what our lives were like doing the Baxter and Mark Morning Show, and what shaped our mindsets during and leading up to our years of doing the show at Orlando Rocker WDIZ in the 80s and 90s. When Facebook came along, over 10 years after our show ended, we were both amazed when so many people started reaching out to us, wanting to find us and share memories of our show in Orlando. To be totally honest, we were both struggling with our careers at this point, trying to remain in a business that had changed so much, and being deluged with reminders of our former glory days in Orlando was, in a way, kind of salt in the wound. But it was also beautiful. Realizing that our silly morning show had left such a lasting impression on so many people, Mark and I talked about it and, and wondered what we should do to respond to it, if anything. I mean, it was years ago, and what could we do to answer the people who were still disappointed that the show was taken away from them by no choice of our own? But before we could arrive at any solution to this quandary, Mark passed away. Not long after that, I began doing The Chronicles as a tribute to Mark and to those people who apparently still considered our show a special part of their lives. Now, I haven't talked about how our show at DIZ ended yet. I will get there. But I thought it was also important to address something else first. That is, what was it about the Baxter and Mark show that made it hold such a special place in people's hearts, even after all those years? Well, I'm sure the radio station owners would tell you it was the music and the station itself. But it's that kind of logic that was responsible for the Baxter and Mark show eventually disappearing from Orlando Radio. I've talked quite a bit about our band, which was certainly one tool in our arsenal. But the foundation of what made the show what it was had to be our humor and personalities working together as Baxter and Mark on a daily morning radio show. Now, trying to describe that to someone is like trying to taste a flavor of soup by reading a list of ingredients. Just can't do it. But still, I know there are people who may hear these chronicles that weren't there to experience the show firsthand live. People who may be wondering, well, what was the big deal? So I thought I'd get a second opinion from someone who was not only there but whose job it was at the time to use the science of the day to figure out just what it was about this show. I've invited our former DIZ program director, Neil Mursky, to join me on this episode to try to answer that. So, Neil, thanks for joining me on the Baxter and Mark Chronicles. Uh, it is truly a pleasure. One of the things uh, that I know was part of your job was sort of figuring out what it was that made the show popular. Can you elaborate on the question I'm trying to answer here, which is, what was it about this show? Well, if I may correct you, I, I think really the biggest part of my job was managing you guys. <laughs> keeping, you, keeping you under control and within, within the confines of F regulations so that we didn't lose our license. I actually started at the end of January in 1990 at DIZ. It was my second time there. But I had worked at the competition a year earlier in 89. I was at Q96 for three months where you were the competition. So I really was studying you a good year before I became your manager. I mean, basically, everybody talks about benchmarks. Uh, they're very, very hard to achieve. And with the equity that the Baxter and Mark show had in Orlando, just from the sheer amount of years you've been on the air there and the consistency of that, you had established some pretty strong benchmarks, whether it was the hideous wake-up calls or characters like Dr. Zonis, the song parodies, Mayberry Vice. There was nothing else like that in Orlando radio, and people loved it. And as a result, the ratings reflected uh, a very successful morning show. You know, other important elements are you know being you know having localization and timeliness. 
And you guys were the masters of that. When Orlando, I'm just trying to think of some example, when everything was going on in Orlando with Jim and Tammy Faye Baker, you did your parody of the Jim and Tammy show. The spring break splat uh, for some of the accidents that happened in the balcony diving over in Daytona. When Bundy was executed, your famous Bye Bye Bundy. And when Desert Storm happened, you had your Hussein song parody of cocaine. You guys dropped the car on an effigy of Saddam Hussein. That may have happened before I arrived. Yeah, that's right, we did. I mean, these are all things that you can't take for granted. There's very few morning shows shows in very few markets that have been able to intertwine themselves into the fabric of the market and become an important part of people's habits when they get up in the morning. I've read research that says that people basically wake up in the morning insecure. And when they turn on a morning show with a couple of characters, with you know a cast of characters, uh, it sort of makes them psychologically feel like part of a group and ease that insecurity. You guys did that, but even more so, you entertained. You were a very entertaining morning show. With the equity of the years of being in that position, just made you stronger and stronger as time went on. When you had the occasion to look at uh, focus groups, research, that sort of thing, proved out what you're saying now? Yeah, it's kind of ironic when you think about it, because for decades, consultants were telling program directors to tell their talent, regardless of the airship, shut up and play the record. They're tuning in to hear Freebird and Stairway to Heaven, but we were constantly, when the ratings started slipping a little bit, everybody went to that default position of make their bit shorter and, and get it an extra two records an hour. And then we did a research study, I think in 91, and it just showed, we asked all kinds of questions about why do you listen to the Baxter and Mark morning show? Do you listen for the music? Do you listen for the news and information? Do you listen for the humor? And, and the numbers for the humor was just over the top. In fact, I dug up an old study that showed that humor is the obvious reason for their popularity. 71% of 25 to 34-year-old men gave funny slash humorous as what they like the most. This goes up to 75% with 35 to 40 year old men. Not one person listed music as the reason why they listen to the Baxter and Mark show. Using that information, I then uh, kind of went against the tide. And although it probably wasn't politically correct, and who knows, maybe even led to my demise, I was suggesting that we cut back the songs and offer more of Baxter and Mark. If I was driving to work, and you guys were in the middle of a bit, I'd sit out in my car in the parking lot because I was afraid I was going to miss something. But in your case, you were afraid you'd miss the reason why you were going to get fired that day from something we did. Well, yeah, yeah, that too. <laughs> <laughs> that too. Nailing down what it was that people were reacting to, what made people loyal, it was, it was the funny stuff that they were hearing on the show. Absolutely. And that was their main reason for tuning in and listening to the Baxter and Mark show. And from your experience as a program director, being involved in, in various media enterprises over the years, would you say that that factor in our show and the Baxter and Mark show was uh, pretty high comparatively? Oh, uh, through the roof. And, and not only was it very high, but there wasn't another morning show in Orlando radio at that time that even came close. So far, I've avoided including any recordings of our show or bits in these chronicles. Here's why. I've always believed that the sense of humor of a culture changes over time. There was a time when a Cheech and Chong album was hysterical. A time when Steve Martin's comedy albums were thought of as genius. For several years, Chevy Chase, Dan Aykroyd, John Belushi on the original Saturday Night Live were creating groundbreaking humor that was repeated by everyone the next Monday at work. But listen to those or watch them now, and it's just not the same. The point is, funny changes. I was concerned that playing back some of the Baxter and Mark bits from 20 years ago would suffer from that. Even if you were there to hear them live back then in Orlando, you would be hearing them now with different ears, a different mindset, a different appreciation for what is funny or entertaining. 
I don't really worry about judgment from people who listen now and don't get it. Some people didn't get us back then. It's more a respect for those who were fans of the show about not tainting their fond memories. The people I'm talking about are a generation of baby boomers who grew up watching black and white episodes of Mayberry and I Love Lucy, many of whom were alive for Woodstock and Vietnam. No internet or personal computers, cell phones, email, or at least those who can remember life without that technology. A different world, a different sense of everything. But how can I tell this story without including some of what made people loyal to that radio show? Even if you can't hear it in the same way now, it might be fun to go back and relive some of it which involves pulling the recordings off of old, moldy, bad-sounding cassette tapes from a box in my garage. Yeah, if you're looking for CD quality, forget it. We couldn't burn our own CDs back then. One of our staples was when Mark and I would take those shows that we grew up watching on TV and twist them in our own way into regular features on our morning show. Shows like Mayberry, which became Opie Gets Nookie, Here's one episode with a personal introduction from Mark. All right, this this one's just for you and all you people out there who have never heard Opie Gets Nookie, Baxter and Mark here on D.I.Z. It's the Opie Gets Nookie Show, starring Opie, 8B, Floyd the Barber, and Sheriff Taylor as Pa. This week's episode takes place on the campus of Princeton University, where Floyd the Barber has brought Opie in hopes of getting him a date with supermodel Brooke Shields. Oh, hurry up, Opie. We've got to keep looking for Brooke, yes. We've covered most of the campus, and I haven't spotted those Calvins yet. But I'm getting tired, Floyd. And, and Paul's really going to be mad when he finds out you brought me all the way up north just to get some celebrity nookie. Oh, now, now don't you worry, Opie. Let me do all the... Oh, oh there, there she is. Where? Over, look, over there. I don't believe it. That's her. Oh, boy, it sure is. She's even more beautiful in person. Now, now, Opie, now you let me handle this. Now, here, man, how do I look? Well, you look just fine, Floyd. Okay, okay, this is my big chance. Now. What Floyd and Opie don't know is that it's really not Brooke Shields. It's really a pledge of the I Felt a Thigh fraternity. And he's been forced to dress like Brooke Shields as part of his initiation, which includes talking and acting just like Brooke at all times. Oh, e excuse me, excuse me, are you Brooke Shields? What? 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 I mean, yes, yes, I am. Miss Shields, I, oh, I've seen all your movies. I especially like oh. Blue Lagoon. Oh, uh -huh. it was so romantic. Uh -huh. uh, after your nude swimming scene, they, they actually had to carry me out of the <laughs> theater in a cold sweat. Now, what can I do for you, sir? Well, I was going to ask you to go out with my young friend over there. Uh -huh. Lend him the benefit of your experience. Oh, he's cute. But now that I finally met you, how about going out with me? See, my, my name is Floyd, and I'm a successful businessman. I own my own barber shop in Mayberry. Three chairs. Oh, it's big, yes. Well, gee, I guess we could go out. Oh, what did you have in mind? Oh, well, why don't we go over to the campus pool and play Blue Lagoon? Well, that sounds like fun. Oh, you don't know how happy you've made me. This is the most exciting day in my life. Well, I guarantee, Floyd, this is one date you'll never forget. Oh, that's wonderful. Maybe you could give me a deal on some well of balsam for my shop. It's the Opie Gets Nookie Show, a Barney Fife production in association with the Mayberry Committee on Sex Education in America. And it's brought to you by Baxter and Mark on D.I.Z. Hey, wake up. It's Baxter and Mark on the D.I.Z. Morning Show.